fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. Before this exciting adventure, a word from our sponsor. General Mills, makers of Cheerios, the oat cereal that's ready to eat, Betty Crocker mixes, and Wheaties, the breakfast of champions, present by special recording, The Lone Ranger. You know, there's one snack that youngsters from 6 to 60 go for, and that's a chocolate fudge brownie, especially when they're perfect brownies, like the kind you'll bake with Betty Crocker chocolate fudge brownie mix, so easy that the youngsters can turn out a perfect batch with no trouble at all. The finest ingredients are right in the mix, including softest silk cake flour, pure vegetable shortening, and rich chocolate flavoring. You just add water and eggs, add nuts if you like, blend and bake. Mmm, fudgy and chewy brownies that will fill a whole cookie jar. Each package of Betty Crocker brownie mix turns out 36 perfect brownies. They're such a treat for a family dessert topped with vanilla ice cream or for a snack when you invite your friends over in the afternoon. Ask your mom to keep several packages of Betty Crocker brownie mix on hand. And someday soon, why not surprise her and bake up a batch of delicious brownies? For extra freshness, keep them in the cookie jar. With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the daring and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. I'm Silver. Hooray! In the heart of the Rocky Mountains, two men sat beside their campfire on the south slope of Mount Redondo. They were shaggy-haired, coarse-featured men named Lige Wilson and Hob Gates. They kept their eyes on their tin plates as they wolfed the noonday meal. Hob finished eating, wiped his mouth on his sleeve, and asked... Well, where's that old Professor Higgins today? You ought to know, Hob. He's out looking at rocks, bushes, and snakes as usual. He never knows when it's mealtime. Well, I reckon most of these scientific fellas are might crazy. Yeah, I reckon so. You know, we made a mistake when we took him in as his partner. We needed a grub steak, Hob, and he furnished it. Yeah. And we put the agreement on record. The professor will get half of everything we find. Yeah. Say, lad, it was you who sold him the idea that there's a mother load of gold ore in Mount Redondo. Do you really think there is? I did, Hob, for a long time. But this trip's just about finished me as a prospector. Well, I'm ready to quit. Hey, with. here comes the professor. On the run. Appears like he's all worked up about something. <laughs> and likely he's found a new kind of bug. Bob! He's bringing a rock. Ben! Ben, look at this! I see it, Professor. It's a rock. Take a closer look. Hold it. E examine it. What? Yeah. By the eternal stars. That's quartz. Rotten quartz that's chock full of gold. Here, let's see, let's see. Here, I've heft it. This kind of ore will last, say, thousands of dollars to the ton. Where'd you find it, Professor? Less than half a mile from here, due west. Let's get going. After staking their claim, the professor and his partners stood admiring the gold-bearing rock that rose in a mound above the gravel. Hobb said, Do you think that Lige and I spent half our lives looking for gold? And you, a greenhorn, had look, to find... Look! Eh? Look at that rare butterfly! What? I must know more about it! No. Turning his back on gold to chase a butterfly. No, lads, the gold don't mean a thing to him. Well, what can we do about it? Our agreement says that if one of us dies, the others get his share of everything we find. Yeah. People are always getting killed by falls in the mountains. Uh, on the down trail, there are lots of narrow ledges where a man could slip and fall to his death. Uh -huh. Especially with a little help. When the professor rejoined Lige and Hobb, the trio began the descent to their camp at the base of the mountain. The professor, experienced in mountain climbing, insisted that the partners link themselves together by a rope. 
He took the lead, and Hob and Lige saw no opportunity to carry out their vicious plan until the three men paused on a ledge above a gorge over 200 feet deep. About 30 feet below them, the narrow trail to Quartz City ran along the face of the mountain. Only a little farther to go, Professor. This ledge slants right on down to meet the trail along the gorge. Yes, but is the trail along the gorge safe? Safe enough. A lot of riders use it to reach Quartz City. Once we're on it, we'll soon reach camp and our horses. And by the night, we'll have our claim filed. Professor, look down there. Eh? Hey? There's another fancy butterfly. Oh, where? Now look where I'm pointing. Sakes alive, that sure is a fancy one. While Lige held the professor's attention, Hobbs, standing behind his back, drew a knife and cut the rope that connected him to the geologist. I still don't see the butterfly. Take a closer look. Oh! 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 Crooks believed the professor's fall would take him to the bottom of the gorge. But unknown to them, he landed on the narrow trail. His fall loosened a slide of shale that nearly covered him. The shale's loose along here. I don't want to step close enough to the edge of the trail to look over. Look over for what? To make sure the professor went into the gorge. He might have landed on the trail. So we'll see the body when we ride along the trail and we'll shove it into the river. You know, that trail's only about 30 feet below us. We've got to travel half an hour to get there. Oh, Dad. Well, let's get going. Lige and Hobb continued on the narrow, gently sloping ledge along the face of the cliff until they reached the base of the mountain. Then they hurried to their camp in a nearby woods. While the crooked prospectors were packing their gear and loading their horses, which had been left in camp, the Lone Ranger and Toto, en route to Quartz City for supplies, were riding along the trail between the base of the mountain and the gorge of the Redondo River. As they rounded a bend, they saw a pile of newly fallen shale. Right in, Toto. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh. Big fella. Better dismount and make sure the trail ahead is safe. Uh, uh, maybe more slide, come, huh? There's not enough shale to block the trail, but then on Toto, a man. Uh, almost covered by shale. He must have fallen from the ledge above. Clear away the shale while I see if he's still alive. Uh, him got rope tied round the waist. Yes, I see it. Look at the end of the rope. It cut clean. So it is. How do it looks as if... A masked man and an Indian. We're here to help you. Now, please lie still and tell me what happened while we bandage your cuts and bruises. I'm sure you're not seriously injured. While his injuries were being treated, Professor Higgins lost all fear of the masked man and the Indian. He identified himself and told how he had been pushed from the ledge by his partners after the discovery of gold. You were lucky to be alive. It wasn't such a long fall. No, but you might have rolled over the edge of this trail and dropped about 200 feet into the gorge. Oh! Oh, Sabi, we hear horses. Yeah, it's just around the bend. Someone on way to Quartz City. There they are. Come ask my... Lodge! Hob, you murderers! There's Higgins alive! You too, put your hands up. A gunslinger! I'll show you! Ow, my hand, it... He's smashing my gun. Drop your gun. Yes, yes, don't shoot. I'm dropping. Now, both of you dismount. Pick up the guns, Toto. Uh, yeah. Let me get them. You fiends, you would-be murderers. Now, look, partner, you got it all wrong. After you fell, we came here as fast as we could to try to help you. That's right, Professor. You can see we even brought your horse for you. I saw the rope. It was a clean cut. Well, uh, a stone must have done it. Some pieces of shale are sharp as knives. Hob, you pushed me. Professor, I slipped and bumped into you. How can you say otherwise? You didn't see what happened. We wouldn't try to kill you. You're our partner. I'll not be your partner for long. I intend to sell my share of the claim. No matter what you do later, we've got to get to town and file on the claim. Professor, this man's right about one thing. You must register your claim. We'll go with you to town. We'll continue our Lone Ranger adventure in just a moment. All over the country, in every direction, how you, how you doing is the question. And here's one the happy, happy people have to say. Eating our Wheaties and do, 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 and okay. Okay. Sure enough, take Midwestern champions, for instance. When Bobby Feller takes the mound, the outfield boys sit on the ground. That Wheaties pitching leaves them there, watching batters fan the air. And when we name our Wheaties crew, Big Ted Klazuski's in there, too. He'll face those hurlers day or night and knock their fastballs out of sight. Bob Feller and Ted Klazuski both know that Wheaties magic. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Wheaties, 
Breakfast of Champions. Keep on eating your Wheaties and you'll be do, 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 and I'll be okay. Now to continue. Though lame and badly shaken, Professor Higgins was able to ride. It was well after dark when the five men reached Quartz City. Toto accompanied the professor, Lige, and Hobb to the office where claims were registered. But the Lone Ranger stopped at the sheriff's office at the edge of town to speak to his friend, Sheriff Matt Clark. Sheriff Clark listened to the Lone Ranger's report of the attempted murder, then shook his head slowly and said, I don't know of anything that can be done. It's the professor's word against the prospectors, and there are two of them. Yes, I see your point, Sheriff. There's no use trying to bring charges against Hobb and Lodge. That's the tough part of trying to serve justice. <coughs> Many's a time I've known a man to be a crook. I had to let him go scot-free because I couldn't prove it. Oh, Toto and the professor are back. Hmm. Is your claim registered, professor? Yes. How do you feel? Lame, but otherwise all right. I'll be as good as new by tomorrow. Toto, did you return the prospector's guns? Ah. Sheriff, Lige and Hobb tried to murder me. I, I told the sheriff all about it. That's right, professor. I'd have those crooks in jail right now if I saw any hope of making a case against them. But well, they'll not have another chance to kill me. I intend to sell my interest in the claim. It'll probably protect you, but it's likely to be a death warrant for the man who buys it. Well, that gives me an idea. Yes? Would you assign your interest to me uh, temporarily? To you, sir? I'd disguise myself as an Easterner who had bought your share. And the crooks would have to accept me as their partner. You figure they'd try to kill you just as they did the professor. Yes. You'd be taking a big chance. Not if you're nearby, Sheriff, to catch the crooks in the act. Your plan sounds feasible. I'll give you title to my share of the claim. After a further discussion of the plan, the sheriff brought a lawyer to his office, and the necessary papers were prepared and signed. Later that evening, the Lone Ranger, disguised as one of the eastern speculators frequently seen in the mining area, entered the cafe. Hobb and Lige were surrounded by a group of excited men who listened to their story of discovery. I am looking for Hobb Wilson and Lige Gates. Yeah, that's us. Oh, yes. You look just as the professor described you. I'm Hobb and this is Lige. Who are you? I'm your new partner. Uh, what? Now, this paper explains everything. I have taken over the professor's interest in the gold claim. He lied. Is that what the paper says? Yeah. According to this, our new partner's name is Justice. I hope you have no objections. No. But we had a partnership agreement with the professor. There's my witness signature showing I accept the terms of the agreement. Oh, sure enough. I suppose you want to see the gold claim. Of course. We're going there in the morning to start moving the service or... I understand you're staying at the hotel. That's right. I'll meet you in the lobby at 7. Continuing his role as an Easterner, the Lone Ranger went to the room he had rented on the first floor of the hotel. He sat in the darkness near the open window until nearly midnight when Toto appeared. After the Indian had stepped silently into the room, the Lone Ranger closed the window and drew the shade. Have you anything to report, Toto? Uh. Me watch crooks like you say. Oh. Then leave cafe, go to hotel room. Their room's on the opposite side of this building. Me know that. Me go near window. It opened a little bit, so me hear what said. What did you hear? Crooks talk of gold claim, then talk a way to kill you. Mm. Are they planning to push me off a cliff? No. Hom say that's not sure way. Lied say plenty time Easterner get killed by blasting powder. Mm. Murder with blasting powder would be practically impossible to prove. That's why crooks plan that way. All right, Toto. Tell the sheriff what you've learned. And Kimasabe, yes. how we follow you. We follow close, crooks see us. Right. Toto, you and the sheriff will have to wait for at least an hour before you start. How we know where you go? Take Professor Higgins with you. I'll try to leave trail signs. But if you don't find them, the professor will know where to go. The following morning, the disguised Lone Ranger rode out of town with Hobb, Lige, and two pack mules. An hour later, the sheriff, Toto, and Professor Higgins rode in the same direction. Get up there. Come on. They were near the foot of Mount Redondo when the unpredictable naturalist saw a dragonfly and cried out, Look at it! A new species of fly unknown to science. It's just fly. Hold on, Professor. Oh, I must have it! It's gone now. No, no, I see it. I'm going after it. Get up. Get up there. Wait. 
Do not go away. Come back here. Come here. But the professor, forgetting his bruises, his gold claim, and his mission, was gone in pursuit of a dragonfly. It was noon when the Lone Ranger and his companions reached their destination and unshouldered the heavy packs they'd carried from the base camp where the mules and horses had been left. They spent considerable time examining the gold claim before Hob and Lige unpacked the supplies, including two cans of giant powder and a coil of fuse. We'll eat and then start to work. That's a good idea. Uh, Mr. Justice, if you'll get the water, Hob and I'll start the fire going. But where'll I find water? Uh, about a quarter mile from here, just past those red rocks over yonder. You'll see the spring when you get there. Uh, here's the canteen. Right. While he's gone, we'll plant the powder and be set to get rid of him when he gets back. Uh, we make sure the Easterner's near the blast. Watch for the chance to knock him out with your gun barrel. Yeah. Then we'll drag him close to the powder. While returning from the spring, the Lone Ranger saw no sign of his friends, but knew they'd had ample time to reach the vicinity and assumed they were waiting and watching from the concealment of a nearby gully or boulder. He had no idea they were at the foot of the mountain, watching in anger as Professor Higgins approached with his captured dragonfly. When the Lone Ranger rejoined Hob and Lige, he saw a fuse projecting from a crevice in the rocks. I see you have the powder bag. Yeah. Uh, pour some of that water into the coffee pot, will you? Uh, yes. The Lone Ranger knew that the crucial moment was at hand. His mind raced as Hob moved to a position behind his back. To defend himself would mean frustration of the plan, and the crooks might remain free to kill a future partner. He heard a sudden movement and instinctively dodged. Hop gun barrel struck a glancing blow, but one that knocked out the man called Justice. He nearly dodged me, but I got him. Good work. Now drag him alongside the rock next to where the powder's planted. Right. Is the fuse all set to light? Yep. Now that'll do. See if he's got any cash. That's a good idea. Greed burned in the eyes of Lige who saw the chance to become sole owner of the rich claim. Standing behind Hob, he raised his gun and brought it down hard. <laughs> the blast might as well kill two men as one. Hob might have squealed anyway. I couldn't be sure of him. Ah, it's lighted. Now to get away from here. Lige ran far to the protection of a boulder, then waited for the blast. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger struck only a glancing blow, regained consciousness. He saw Hob lying nearby. Then, within arm's reach, he saw the burning fuse. Fuse. Powder blast. Grim peril swept the cobwebs from his brain. He pinched off the fire at the end of the fuse, then sat up. Otto, the sheriff, where are they? What happened to Hub? Lige waited many times as long as it should have taken the fuse to reach the powder, then moved cautiously back to find out what had gone wrong. He saw the two men lying as he had left them, and the fuse cold and only partly consumed. Ah, went out. No wonder the blast didn't go off. Well, there's plenty of fuse left. I'll just light it again. There. But don't move. What? You're covered. Yeah, well, I'll shoot you. No, no. As his bullet smashed the crook's half-drawn gun, the Lone Ranger leaped to his feet. Now it's your turn to take it. No, no, wait. One more. No, wait. Don't hit me again. Stay there on the ground. Try to get up and I'll shoot. No, we've got to get away. The fuse is burning. It'll fire the blast. Yeah, there he is. You're just in time. Settle it somewhere else. That fuse. Don't move. Are you all right? Yes. The sheriff will be blown up. That fuse is burning to powder. Lige, listen to me. Hob is dead. Who killed him? we got to get away. I don't want to be suspected of killing him. So you're going to tell the truth before you move. I'll talk later. That fuse. Who killed Hob? I didn't mean to hit him on the head the same as he hit you. Only harder. I didn't mean to kill him. You meant to kill us both with powder. I didn't. I, I, uh, uh, I say, what's happened to him? Fainted. Probably from fear. Say, that fuse is burning close to the crevice. I removed the powder, Sheriff. The fuse is harmless. I'll tell you later how it all happened. The main point is, did you hear Lige confess to the murder of Hob? Yes, and I'll handcuff the critter while he's asleep. That evening, the Sheriff called at Professor Higgins' hotel room. He found the scholarly man seated at a desk and greatly preoccupied with books and a mounted dragonfly. Professor, I brought back the paper you signed, giving Mr. Justice your share of the gold claim. Uh, oh, oh, that. You'd better tear it up. Oh, please do that, Sheriff. Hob is dead and Lige will hang for murder. That makes you sole owner of what appears to be the richest gold claim in Colorado. I shall build a school in the West. With trained men, we may find further wonders, like this dragonfly. Oh, that dragonfly. I've checked the books. I'm sure it's the only one of its kind in existence. Sheriff, because of that, 
I propose to name it the Lone Ranger. copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated is produced by Pendle Campbell Muir Incorporated. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Your announcer, Fred Foy. Listen to the Lone Ranger, brought to you by special recording Mondays through Fridays at this same time.